I'm Liz Faubless, and this is Currents. Do new U.S. health care mandates trample on religious freedom? The church weighs in. Plus, activists gather in Washington to march for life. We'll get a roundup from D.C. And how abortion hits home for one group of women. You are shameful, you are guilty, yet you can't say a word. And that's the secret of the pain of abortion. On Friday, the Department of Health and Human Services announced it will not expand a religious exemption to its health care mandate. The announcement means most religious organizations will be required to offer employees insurance that includes contraception, sterilization, and abortion-inducing drugs. Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sibilis says employers will be required to inform employees about places where contraceptive services are available. Sibilis says religious employers who object to the rules will have until August 1st of 2013 to comply. Now critics say an exemption to that rule is extremely narrow. To qualify for it, an employer must teach religious values and serve mainly people who share those values. At a morning mass at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., Cardinal Designate Timothy Dolan, president of the U.S. Bishops Conference, discussed the clashing of church and state. When our government places conception, pregnancy, and birth itself under the Center for Disease Control, we might be tempted to give up hope. When chemically blocking conception or aborting the baby in the womb is considered a right even to be subsidized by others who abhor it, we might be tempted to give up. Cardinal Designate Dolan was the main celebrant at this morning's mass, marking the close of the vigil for life in Washington, D.C. Now, earlier today, I talked more about the mandate with Sister Mary Ann Walsh. She's the, direct, she's the director, that is, of media relations for the U.S. Bishops Conference. Sister Mary Ann Walsh, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Well, basically what this is saying, if I get the understanding correctly, is that employers like religiously affiliated hospitals have one year to get in step with a law that requires mandatory contraceptive coverage. What are the implications here, in your opinion? They're putting the schools, hospitals, social service agencies in the awkward position of having to choose between being true to their Catholic identity and following their Catholic principles or serving people. Sure. Catholics serve people. We serve people because of mm -hmm. their creed, because of their need. It's not because of their creed. You know, we serve people because we're Catholic, not because they're Catholic. But this rule would say you could only get a religious exemption if you only served your co-religionist. I have a uh, Franciscan sister, Jane Marie Klein, saying that this is nothing less than a direct attack on religion and First Amendment rights. Now, she's the chairwoman of the board at Franciscan Alliance. That's a system of 13 Catholic hospitals. Has the Obama administration crossed too many lines here? I think they have definitely crossed too many lines. They've, they've made an incursion into religious freedom never seen before in this country. They're actually saying to Catholic organizations, you have to pay for something you don't believe in, indeed something that you are opposed to. I mean, they're saying to a university like Notre Dame, you can teach Catholic teaching, but you have to live out something else. So you have to buy contraceptives for your students, even though you're teaching concern for them. Sister, we also have the Republican Policy Committee taking the government to task as well for ruling against the church. And, of course, we have pro-abortion groups like Planned Parenthood enthusiastically backing the administration's move. Now, Kathleen Sibilla says that the government's decision strikes an appropriate balance between religious freedom and increasing access to preventive health services. Now, given the contrasting views that we're seeing, did the government miss its mark in creating this so-called balance, in your opinion? Oh, the government is completely off the mark. Even the Washington Post came out this morning and said that the government is wrong. This is not a pro-life group. 
And uh, sister, this decision, of course, could not be more ironic. Today, as you know, thousands of anti-abortion activists marching on the U.S. Supreme Court in an annual demonstration to mark the uh, Roe, v. Wade Roe v. Wade, that is, decision. And now the Department of Health and Human Services mandate dealing the moral fiber of the Catholic community yet another blow decades later. Where do we go from here? I think we have to look at the options. This is the most serious threat of religious freedom that we've seen in centuries. Mm -hmm. George Washington, James Madison, the founders of our country, were very clear that the right to express, live out your religion was a sacred right. It was very; in, it should be treated very sensitively. I mean, George Washington was very strong on that, and that there should be a leaning toward religious freedom, certainly not against religious freedom. And sister, I'm, I'm sure as you know this, our bishops vow to fight the order, saying that it is literally unconscionable. What can be done to not only extend the exemption, but perhaps make it a permanent exception, in your opinion? Well, that's, some, that's something being explored right now, whether it would have to go to the courts. I don't know whether this is something that could be handled legislatively. I don't know whether President Obama could realize that this was a grave mistake in undo the damage? I don't know. I mean, everything is being looked at right now, but it is a very serious mistake. There's no question about that. Sister, it's one thing to force Catholic and other faith-based businesses to comply to this order, but it is still in the power of those institutions to actually help educate employees about the church's stance on birth control and other pro-life initiatives. Will this become a greater effort, in your opinion, a kind of preemptive strike on the part of those organizations? Well, all the teaching of the world of your employees is not going to take away the fact that the government says you have to provide these services. Well, yes, I mean, employees, everybody has to understand Catholic teaching, and education is a lifelong endeavor. You know, most, sometimes we make the mistake and think that our education, particularly our religious education, ended at confirmation. It doesn't. It's lifelong. And the other thing that's, uh, it's not only uh, contraception, it's sterilization, and it's also uh Included in the contraception are drugs that lead to abortions, that cause abortion. And so it's more than just contraception. This Sis is not just the pill. Sister Marianne, thank you very much. I'm afraid that is the last word, but I'm sure we will be hearing a lot more of this. Thank you so much, Sister You're Marianne welcome. Walsh, for joining us. All right, bye. And stay tuned. There's more Currents ahead. We'll have all the news from today's annual March for Life, along with the rest of the day's headlines. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Liz Faubless. Coming up later, abortion hits home for one group of women, and they share their stories. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, for the 39th time, pro-life activists gathered in Washington. Hundreds of thousands from across the country took to the streets with the ultimate goal, bringing about an end to abortion. And despite the less than ideal weather, it rained much of the time that did nothing to stop people from gathering at Washington, D.C.'s National Mall. There, House Speaker John Boehner asked the crowd for its help in getting the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act passed. With your help, this bipartisan majority is standing up for life and working to restore the damage uh, with regard to Roe. We are heeding the voice of the people who overwhelmingly oppose taxpayer funding of abortion. And the legislation passed the House, but the Senate has yet to take up the bill. And we will have more from the March for Life later in the show. But last night, Houston Galveston Archbishop Cardinal Daniel DiNardo celebrated the opening mass of the Vigil for Life at Washington's Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. DiNardo, who chairs the U.S. Bishops Committee on Pro-Life Activities, said young people are key to the pro-life movement. The Cardinal called for timely and unwavering actions to defend religious freedom. Meanwhile, the annual West Coast Walk for Life took place in San Francisco. Reporter Nick Smith has more on that. Hey, hey, hey. Goodbye. Two groups with two very different views on life in the womb took to the streets of San Francisco. The West Coast Rally for Reproductive Justice said that they would march rain or shine, marking the 39th anniversary of Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to choose. And just up the street, the annual Walk for Life, an anti-abortion group calling for a repeal of that Supreme Court decision. The West Coast Walk for Life drew demonstrators from across the country, young and old. 
It's important to show the family that they're part of something a little larger. Rick Cartier and his family represent three generations of those who believe that every life has value. Uh, we've done it three years in a row now. Again, just to show the kids that we stand for we're a pro-life family and to participate with uh, other pro-life people. The group that started at Civic Center marched peacefully down Market Street, holding signs while flanked by SFPD. The pro-life movement is the civil rights movement of our generation. John Johnson is a youth minister who escorted 10 busloads of young people to San Francisco for today's rally. We all just want to stand up and make a difference. There were only a handful of pro-choice demonstrators, and that may be because they have the court on their side. The groups did find one more opportunity to clash. This Starbucks off of Justin Herman Plaza had both coffee and spirited debate. And closer to home, the Archdiocese of New York has announced a new initiative to help couples, couples, that is, whose children may be born with birth defects. Now, the new effort by the Archdiocese Pro-Life Commission is looking to build a network of health care and providers and counselors. Now, the aim is to lend support and care to parents who are told that their unborn children may have severe or life-threatening birth defects. The Archdiocese is looking for anyone who may be able to join the network. Disabled children and abortion abortion was the focus of a talk yesterday by Philadelphia Archbishop Charles Chaput. Speaking at the annual Cardinal O'Connor Conference in Washington, Chaput said babies with Down syndrome are aborted because of something that is neither fatal nor contagious. He said children with disabilities are not a burden, they're a priceless gift to all of us. President Obama marked the 39th anniversary of the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision, which legalized abortion in all 50 states, with a statement saying the decision protects a woman's health and reproductive freedom. He says it also affirms a broader principle that government should not intrude in private and family matters. The statement came just two days after the Obama administration announced that most religious groups would be forced to provide contraception and sterilization in their health care plans regardless of whether doing so violates the group's religious beliefs. Well, from the Vatican, Washington Archbishop Cardinal Donald Worrell says Americans should not allow faith to be brushed aside. Speaking with Catholic News Service from Rome, Worrell says the only way that's going to happen is by way of renewal of our own faith. World was in Rome for the bishop's regular ad limina visits with Pope Benedict. And the Pope is calling for Christians to join ranks. Rome Reports has more on that. During the traditional Sunday Angelus in St. Peter's Square, Benedict XVI called for everyone's prayers for the unity of all Christians. In esta semana de oración por la unidad de los cristianos, exhorta a todos a poner los ojos en el triunfo de Cristo, para que la contemplación de la meta de esa esperanza dirija nuestras acciones y plegarias. The Pope recalled that the text used this year during the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity were prepared in Poland, where the Christian faith has had a unifying and transformative effect on the country. Benedict XVI noted that unity requires an internal transformation to let in God. Per usare una espressione che ripeteva spesso il piatto Papa Giovanni Paolo II, ogni dono diventa anche impegno. L'unità che viene da Dio esige dunque il nostro quotidiano impegno di aprirci gli uni agli altri nella carità. The week of prayer for Christian unity will end on Wednesday with an ecumenical prayer in the Basilica of Rome's St. Paul outside the walls for the feast of his conversion. There will also be members of other Christian denominations for the celebration. The Pope also sent his best wishes to the countries of the Orient that are celebrating the Chinese New Year of the Dragon, saying he hoped it would be full of justice and peace. Elsewhere, Newt Gingrich is again the leader of the pack, at least for now. After taking this weekend's Republican presidential primary in South Carolina, Gingrich took 40 percent of the vote, handily defeating the man who has been considered the frontrunner, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney. Now, Gingrich is one of two Catholics in the race. The other, former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum, came in a distant third with 13 percent of the vote.
From Nigeria, two churches were attacked this weekend, part of a series of attacks in the country's northern region that killed more than 200 people. According to reports, the two churches were empty at the time of the attacks and no injuries were reported at either location. Reports say that at least 178 people were killed in a separate attack on Friday in northern Nigeria's main city. One doctor says the death toll there could be as high as 250. It comes just weeks after an Islamist group called for all Christians to leave northern Nigeria. Meanwhile, an archdiocese in the Sudan says kidnappers are demanding a large sum for the release of two priests. The archdiocese tells the Vatican news agency Fidesz that the kidnappers are demanding a ransom of $185,000. The archdiocese is reportedly trying to secure a release that will not encourage other kidnappings. And a spokesman for the Catholic Church in Egypt says ousted President Hosni Mubarak should not be given the death penalty. The spokesman says no one has the right to take another person's life, even if that person is guilty of horrible crimes. Mubarak is accused of ordering Egypt's military to fire on protesters during last year's uprisings. 850 people died in a hail of gunfire. Well, stay tuned. There's more currents coming up. Just ahead, there may have been rain, but the March for Life was anything but a washout. We'll hear all about it. Welcome back. Well, one day after the 39th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which was the Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion, hundreds of thousands of anti-abortion activists from all walks of life gathered at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to speak out against that controversial and politically charged ruling. We heard from Nellie Gray, who founded the March for Life, and politicians including House Speaker John Boehner, as well as clergy, all addressing the right to life issue, a few with fiery sermons that uplifted the attendees. Tablet reporter Antonina Jelinska is in Washington, D.C., covering the march for us. She joins us now to talk about the events, which began as early as Saturday. Antonina, we appreciate your giving us your first-hand point of view of this event. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. First, I want to ask you, what was the mood among the attendees today? I know there are still hundreds of people there, but was it somber, enthusiastic? Because it looks like the weather appeared not to have dampened the turnout. Yeah, it's a little misty, but, you know, it is not freezing cold like it was last year, and people's spirits keep them warm, and they're singing, and they're so excited that they can be part of this huge movement that hopefully will turn a couple of votes in Washington. It sounds, it sounds like a great event. Have members of our diocese here in Brooklyn and in Queens shown up in force? Have you spoken to any supporters of the march that are close to home? Oh, there's many, many people from Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, there's buses in the diocese. There's buses from uh, parishes. There's a, bu a whole bus from in that conception uh, seminary. So you have young and old alike from Brooklyn and Queens all excited here uh, and just be part. And what's most important about it is that they mingle to get everyone from the entire country to speak in one voice. So it's not just Brooklyn and Queens. It's not just one diocese. It's the entire world, the entire nation. Antonin, and you've listened to a lot of the speeches. You heard from House Speaker John Boehner, who is the leader of the bipartisan pro-life majority, saying he has 11 brothers and sisters, a great respect for life that was instilled in him early on. And he's also saying that pro-life is not a label or a political position. How important was that for the crowd to have the politics taken out of this issue? You know, uh, the rally is important as it is. Many people were not able to hear it. Uh, the march became more important, so I was among the people who was not able to be close enough to hear uh, the rally. But uh, the way that I heard that message was this morning at 9, uh, Archbishop Dolan uh, spoke of the importance of just being united to bring Christ into this uh, message. So I think that there's many different ways to hear that message. It's nice to hear that the politicians and all religious leaders are unified in this, uh, in this attempt. And as is the case with a lot of large rallies, I have to ask you, did you see any distractions today? Had you seen any proponents of abortion maybe on the sidelines uh, attempting to have their views known as well? You know, surprisingly not. Last year we did see a couple, not too many. And this year, in my eyes, I have not seen any at all. They're here or not, they should be. But I have uh, marched most of the, the march out most of the way, and I have not seen one single person. So I don't know what that says. 
I, I, okay, that, that's some, that remains to be seen as well, what that says. But we do hear a common thread about, among the people that we're speaking, that there seems to be a lot of work ahead of us. That seemed to be the common theme of all the speakers that we heard from today, the politicians, clergy, even Nellie Gray. Is there any sense at all of hope that one day we will see Roe v. Wade reversed? What were you hearing? You know, I think, especially among the Catholic, among the diocese, it's, uh, it's not everything is possible. So maybe the march won't make this stop tomorrow, but it is brought into politics. And it, with the power of God, I feel like, with the communion, with the Eucharist, I think that's in that we have two masses starting. That is what made everything important. Because with the power of God, this can change. Like, uh, we know that where the two or three gather together to uh, praise God, there is Jesus. So we hope that today Jesus is with us, March, Jesus is with us marching them, anything is possible. And having said that, there were morning masses at the Verizon Center and the D.C. Armory. More than 27,000 young people attending those events. Is it encouraging to see so many of our nation's youth coming together to celebrate these pro-life initiatives, the theology and the teachings? What role do you think they expect to play in bringing about an end to Roe v. Wade? Well, you know, they say that the pro-life movement is an old and decaying life. Well, that is not what we see here. Most people here are very young. It is, uh, they have the energy and they used to come all the way out here to Washington to show their support. And I am just, uh, right now, there's a uh, hundred young people are passing by uh, me right now with their signs to defend life. Uh, anywhere I look, it's mostly a great majority of the people are very young. And so I think that shows who will be voting in the future. Antonina, it sounds like a wonderful event, and you've covered it very well for us. Thank you so much. We're speaking to Antonina Jelinska. She's our tablet reporter, joining us live for the March for Life. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. Absolutely. Stay tuned. There's more Currents coming up. When we return, women who have had abortions find hope and healing. I don't do this for myself. Um, it's really him speaking through me to let other people know that they can be healed. Finally tonight, on a day when people gathered in Washington to show their support for all life and their opposition to abortion, we take time to hear from a group of women who know the effects of abortion. They are women who have had abortions and want to share the wisdom of what they experience with others. We caught up with them at last year's March for Life. As a post-abortive woman, the last place that I ever wanted to be was the March for Life. And about seven years ago, I attended a march just to see what the feeling would be. And there was such a sense of acceptance and love and forgiveness here. It was something that really gave me a lot of hope. Everyone has different story, but the same themes of, you know, the brokenness, the shame, maybe the anger, and then the steps towards healing. We're here and we're accessible and, and people can approach us one-on-one. -on -one. Um, even just wearing our buttons around, around the hotel here. It's just so many different ways that the message is going out now, which is beautiful. It's like a pilgrimage, you know, that, that we do coming here every year, and I'm very blessed to be able to, to make this journey. It is not easy to go up there and, and hold a sign saying, I regret my abortion. But with faith, God gives you the grace to be an instrument. It's his work. It, it, I don't do this for myself. Um, it's really him speaking through me to let other people know that they can be healed. When I left the clinic that day, this was a trauma that I knew I could never speak about. And I just kept this deep within my soul, and that's where the pain starts. Because you just, your self-worth is nothing. You are shameful, you are guilty, yet you can't say a word. And that's the secret of the pain of abortion. Pope John Paul II, in his Gospel of Life, speaks specifically to women that have had an abortion. And he says that we can be the biggest defenders of life, okay, by, you know, going through a healing process. We know what we've done is wrong, but with our testimonies and speaking out, we can change people's hearts and really defend life in a way that nobody else can. I had three abortions in my life. Um, the first one when I was 17, 
um, all with the same, the same uh, partner. And it was a long time ago, you know, it was over 30 years ago now. And I didn't even realize how much it affected me uh, until I was having, we were trying to have our children that we, we intended to keep. I was outside of the church at the time. I didn't know anything about God. I joined a prayer group. And the more I learned about God's love, then the more I was able to look at my own life. I think you need that perspective. You have to understand that God is a loving God before you can look at your own, your own mess, <laughs> so to speak. As you're holding your sign and people walk by and you connect, you see people connect with you and you can feel in their hearts, like they're, they look at you like, oh, I'm so sorry, I wish I could be where you are. Uh, thank you for speaking for me. It's really beautiful to see that connection, that human. I mean, we are all human. We're made to support and encourage and promote life. I'm 45. Um, my daughter would be 23 years old. So half my life was spent in grief, and I didn't know that that's what was wrong. I went from doctor to doctor to doctor, thinking I had some kind of emotional problem, some kind of psychological problem. And the people in the field, all they wanted to do was medicate me. It wasn't until um, I had a conversion to the Catholic faith 16 years ago and realized that there was something else going on, but didn't know who to talk to. And priests didn't know where to send me until Rachel's Vineyard was involved. For so many years, women and men have been silenced by shame. They've held their abortion as a very carefully guarded secret and a very deeply traumatic experience. And so to be with others, to be able to honor their child publicly, it's very healing. It's another level of breaking out of the secret and the denial. I've chosen to speak out about it because I don't want to live anymore in secrecy. I lived many years in this secret and my whole purpose is to get away from the shame, you know, to say this is the truth. I take full responsibility for what I have done, um, but I also want to make sure that other women and men don't go through that same path. And if they have, that there is healing available. No more, I'm free from the lies. Love opened my eyes. I will be silent no more. And we will have much more on this year's March for Life on tomorrow night's show. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also connect with us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fawbless. Thank you for watching and have a good night. Mm -hmm.